Well, good morning, church. How's everybody doing? You guys doing good? I'm proud of you guys. You came back after I talked to you about sin for 40 minutes last week. That just shows you guys are believers. Um, welcome. Uh, we, we are going to continue. Uh, last week I thought was very special, and we're going to continue in that, uh, continue talking about forgiveness. And as you saw last week, we talked about forgiveness, our forgiveness from the Lord, and today we're going to be talking about forgiving others. So I entitled the message, The Power of Forgiveness. So we're continuing in the study of the Lord's Prayer. Has anybody enjoyed this study? Wow, I guess I need to change studies. Well, I'm, I'm getting text message and emails. You guys are enjoying it. But, wow, what a special thing that we get to dig into a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. And I hope you guys have been taking notes and learning. But it's not just a, a prayer that is supposed to be um, just memorized or recited. I know there's a lot of people that can memorize it, but they don't know what it means. And so one thing that we've learned about the Lord's Prayer, it's a model uh, it's meant to shape your prayer life, um, and it's a model for how we are to approach God. So what a special thing that we get to dig in. So today we're talking about the fifth petition, where Jesus tells us to pray, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, okay? Um, or as we forgive those who sin against us. So last week we talked about the first half of the verse, forgive us our sins and our forgiveness. And we learned that our deepest spiritual need, we talked about, he talked about bread, how man's deepest physical need is for bread. But then he moves to forgiveness. And man's deepest spiritual need is for forgiveness. That we have a world that's looking for forgiveness. And this week we're talking about forgiving others. Uh, as the scripture says, we are to forgive others as the Lord has forgiven us. So forgiving others comes easy, right? <laughs> uh, it comes natural, right? Is there anyone in here besides me that struggles with this? Okay, then you all must not be married. <laughs> we have a lot of opportunity to forgive. Wait, did my wife just say amen? <laughs> she just put up two hands. I thought you did that for worship. You just, I love you. It's true, though. I mean, I mean, let's be honest, women. Why did God create husbands? To teach y'all how to forgive. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Marriage. We have opportunities, don't we, Greg? Opp opportunities to forgive. Marriage. In-laws. Cats. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Target. Oh, my gosh. They're abounding. How about Traffic. Or how about road work? Um, we're almost done. That's what they tell me, but they've been telling me that for three months. <laughs> They're never going to be done. You know, it's so funny. C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors. He says, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until you get done wrong. And so we need to talk about this. It doesn't come natural. It's not easy for us. But I can tell you that Forgiveness is one of the most important things that you need to understand. It's critical for the Christian life. I know a lot of people that go to church that are bound up and caught and in prison, and it normally has to do with their inability to forgive. I want to say to you that unforgiveness, like nothing else in your life, will block the flow of God and the blessing of God in your life. Are y'all with me? So I don't know what you've come with, but I know God brought you here because he wants you to release it. Because that's what puts you in prison. And so it's amazing that Jesus stops in this prayer and he says, listen, there's something you gotta understand before you're gonna get the car out of park. Before you're gonna be able to walk in the spirit and you're gonna be able to fulfill the calling on your life, well, you have to confess your sins to me and receive forgiveness and then you also have to forgive others. And until you do that, you're not fully walking in the fullness of God. It shackles you. 
And I want to I want to say to you guys that you are never more like God when you forgive. You are never more like God. Forgiveness is at the heart of the character of God. We know that one of the last things that Jesus said from the cross was what church? Father, for they know not what they do. From Genesis to Revelation, it was a story, a theological story about forgiveness. And that's the deepest need that you have. And it's only when we are forgiven that forgiveness can flow through our lives. And that's what I'm going to be talking about, so buckle up. But it should be the mark of your life. Because you've been forgiven so much, it should come freely from us. When you're walking, when you're willing to walk in forgiveness to others, it releases a blessing. I say this to you a lot, but forgiveness is like a key that unlocks the kingdom of God in your life. That if you're willing to forgive, it's amazing. It's like the floodgates of heaven can come upon your life. And you can walk in the fullness. So I want to tell you a story, and this is a heavy story. I want to start with a heavy story, but it's, I was reading this week, um, and maybe you've heard of this name, Corey Tin Boom. Um, but uh, Corey Tin Boom wrote this book, The Hiding Place. I encourage you guys, good reading. Uh, it's very, very rich. So she was a Dutch woman who lived with her family in the Netherlands in World War II. And during the Holocaust, Corey and her family, what they did was they hit Jews from the Nazis. It's documented that they hit about 800 Jews and saved a lot of people's lives because as a strong Christian, the Ten Booms, they, they believed that they had a calling to help God's chosen people. So there was a staircase and they built in this hiding place in their house where they would hide the Jews. And eventually they were found out by the Nazis and uh, the father and, the, and the, her sister, Betsy, were sent to a concentration camp at Ravensbrück. And the father died about 10 days into it, and Corey and Betsy had to endure the horrors of the concentration camp. And eventually, her sister Betsy would die in the camp. And Corey miraculously made it out. But Corey was a strong Christian. When she made it out, and it was basically on a health technicality, she made it out, she was a strong Christian. She felt like God was calling her to preach the message of forgiveness. So she said, okay, Lord, there's a calling on my life. You miraculously helped me get out of Ravensbrook. I'm gonna use my life for the glory of God. And she went on a crusade through Europe and she was preaching the word of God and teaching on forgiveness. And then this happened. In 1947, shortly after the war, war, she was preaching at a Christian church in Munich, Germany, and she was talking about forgiveness. And shortly after the service, she says, I looked up and I saw him. This was a former SS man that stood guard over the gas chambers at Ravenbrook. This was the first Nazi guard that she had seen since the war. And she said, it all came back. And he starts to approach the altar where she's praying for people. And if you read the story, she starts thinking about the heaps of clothing. She starts thinking about her, her sister Betsy and how frail she got. And the number of people that were abused by the guards. And he comes up to the altar And he walks in, he walks up to her, and horrified as she was, he says, will you forgive me? And he reached out his hand, and Corey said, I couldn't take his hand. She was preaching on forgiveness, but there was a moment. Everything was flooding her thoughts, and she said, I can't do it. And he said, will you forgive me? Anger, vengeance, thoughts running wild. 
And she prayed a prayer, Lord, help me to forgive. And then I want to read you the quote of what happened in her life. This is super powerful. This is from her own mouth. She said, I had to take the man's hand. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. I told myself, I can lift my hand. I can do that much. Jesus, you supply the feeling. And as I reached out my hand, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder and raced down my arm, and it sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flow through my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother. I cried with all my heart, and for a long moment we grasped each other's hands and the former guard and the former prisoner. And this is what she said, she concludes. She said, I have never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Isn't that powerful? She said, I had, I, she was a Christian her whole life. But it was in that moment that she extended forgiveness to someone who brutally killed her own family. She said, in that moment, I have never experienced the love of God like that. And I just want to challenge you guys today. I want to challenge you. You want to unlock the kingdom of God in your life. You want to see the flow of God in your life. Release forgiveness. You might not even know you're carrying it. I mean, there was a period of time where I had so much anger um, when I first started ministry and, 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 you know, anger and stress and these different things. And I went and saw a counselor and, and she looked at me and the first thing she said is, have you forgiven your parents? And I'm like, wait, wait, I haven't even been thinking about my birth parents. But it was in that moment that I realized, wow, what's driving my anger? I realized it was unforgiveness. And I know that I'm not the only one in this, in this big auditorium that have had things done to them, wrongs done to them. And forgiveness doesn't mean you condone those sin, doesn't mean you excuse the sin, but it means because Christ forgave you of so much, you have to extend it. And that's when the kingdom will flow in your life. You will feel new. That's the words of Apostle Paul. When we hold it, um, this is what happens. He says, he says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. Brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Paul says, get rid of it. Get it out of your heart. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Wow, it's really silent in here. <laughs> Are you all with me? Somebody say amen. It's okay. I know it feels like you're going to the dentist. Although we love our dentist, don't we, Trey? <laughs> But when I go to Trey, man, I love it. <laughs> Trey's like, you're killing my business, Jamie. <sighs> God's got to get to the infection. And it's painful. That's how you get healed. Mm. Forgive just as Christ forgave you. The heart of forgiveness is offering to other people the same grace that has been afforded to us. And I said, it, I said it at the beginning, adversely nothing, and I'd say nothing can stop the flow of God in your life like unforgiveness. I just want you to think about this word. I'm going to put it up there. Unforgiveness. It's incredibly destructive. The Mayo Clinic says that people that, that don't forgive, they have more stress have more anxiety, they have more health problems, they're generally angrier people. I mean, the statistics prove it out. 
it actually kills us holding unforgiveness. Spiritually and physically, it becomes a prison and it so easily hinders our growth. And just like the Grinch, and I know it's not, not Christmas, but I always talk about the Grinch. Just like the Grinch, what happened? It put him up in a cave, alone, with bitterness and anger and rage. It can steal your life and your joy. And unforgiveness is costly. Nelson Mandela has one of my favorite quotes. He says, bitterness, which is what happens with unforgiveness, is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. It's a good quote. That's what unforgiveness is like. Bitterness is like drinking poison and then waiting for the other person to die. Frederick Buechner has this a, a wonderful quote too. He says, uh, this theologian, he says, of the deadly sins, anger is, pr- is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. Hmm. And, you know, and Hebrews is very clear about this. Uh, Hebrews talks about, see to it that no one misses the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and to defile many. What happens? Bitterness leads to bitter root. And Hebrews says, what does it do? It defiles us. It steals from us. It robs from us. Unforgiveness defiles you. It's like poison. And one of the questions that I'm going to be asking you through this sermon that you need to think about is, what unforgiveness have you been carrying? I believe the Holy Spirit is here. And I believe the Holy Spirit wants to, wants to put his finger on some people in your life that you have been carrying unforgiveness to. And I think today is a day that you could do business with God. And I think today is a day that you could see re- blessings released in your life. So Jesus doubles down on this, and he addresses the topic of unforgiveness Um, in a parable. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18, if you're there. If you got your Bibles, you know what I like to do. Hold it up and say a word. Okay, there's a lot of tablets. That's amazing. Okay, trying to get you to bring your Bibles. You know, I sometimes put it up there, sometimes I don't, but we really want you to get into the Word. Have your own Bible that you can underline and you can mark. There's nothing more precious gift to you than the word of God. So I want you to come expecting that we're going to preach the word to you and that it's alive and active and there's going to be something directly for your life that can change your life. That's why I encourage you to bring, your, bring the Bible. So this is a parable of the un, unforgiving servant, okay, in Matthew chapter 18. And if you know parables allegorical stories to illustrate truth. And so this story is about a king, and in this story, the king represents God. And then he has servants, and the servants are us. And it begins with a question about forgiveness from Peter, okay? So I'm going to read verses 21 and 22. I'll, I'll actually put it up here for you. 18 verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, How many times shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not 70 times, but 77 times. It's very funny, I think. Peter, he wants a number. He's like, he wants a number. He's like, hey, Jesus, on the eighth time, can I punch someone in the face? I mean, seriously. And let's be honest. Don't you want a number with some people? I do. I'd like there to be a number for me to be like, I'm done with you. 
I mean, I was thinking about the sermon this week, and I, I'm going to tell you this story, and I probably shouldn't, but I have a, a friend, you know, in my life, and, and, you know, we all have them, you know, whether they're families, they're friends, and they just, it just, every time you, every time you interact with them, it's like you leave kind of hurt, or there's something that's been said, or just, you're, you're getting offended, and it's, it's so funny, so I'm like, all right, I'm going to throw out the olive branch, and I'm going to send this person, even though I've done it 70 times, and every time I seem to get hurt again, but I'm just going to send them um, our family picture. I'm going to send them the family picture, you know, and, you know, to try to, you know, bless them and just tell them, look, I love you, even though every single time I'm mad at you. And uh, funny thing is, um, I send the family picture, and uh, I get a text message back like a day afterwards. And the text message says, hey, uh, hey Jamie, um, your family looks great. But, Jamie, I'm worried about you. You look tired. And you know that tired is code word for you look terrible, right? When someone tells you you're tired, that's not a compliment. But let me just say something. The text message wasn't over yet. So they say that. Then they go on to say, you know, I never thought I'd say this about you, buddy. But you are really starting to age. My blood's boiling. Why did I send them the card? So I'm, I'm working on forgiveness, right? I got something sent up just saying, hey, love you. I'm glad you got the card, you know? Before I could hit send, there's another text message. And I'm like, wow. And the last one is so offensive. I can't believe I'm telling you guys this. He said, uh, they said, um, hey, uh, hey, Jamie, uh, no offense. And you know when someone says no offense, right? That is the most ungodly thing to say. No offense, I'm just getting ready to trash you. He says, no offense, Jamie, but uh, you're looking kind of pudgy. And then had the nerve to say, maybe you should try the keto diet. It's working for me. At that point, I'm ready to explode. And I'm like, maybe you should try the shut your mouth diet. Maybe you should try the look in the mirror diet. But Kimber wouldn't let me. She never lets me. But don't you wish sometime you had a number that you could just say, you know what? You've crossed the line. I'm done with you. But Christ won't let us do that. As C.S. Lewis said, forgiveness it sounds easy. It's a lovely idea until you're faced with a wrong. Peter would say, and when it keeps happening. Because the rabbis back in Peter's day, they said that we must forgive two times at the most three, but never four. So when Peter says seven, he thinks he's going high. And Jesus says, no, Peter, not seven. 70 times 7, which is 490, and Peter's probably writing it down. <laughs> but it's hyperbole, and you know what it means? There's no limit. What if God had a limit for your life? You think you might have hit 490? I might have hit 490 this morning with my kids. <laughs> Getting them to church, I hit 490, um, even though it's always my wife. So... That's the first thing Peter says, right? There's no boundaries to forgiveness. And then, classic Jesus. Peter's asking a question. Jesus says, I'm, I'm going to change the question. Because, Peter, you want to know this, but what you really need to know is this. He says, Peter, before we can talk about how much you should forgive others, I want to talk about how much you need to be forgiven. Because you want to know what the key is? You want to know what the key to uh, forgiveness is? Is you understanding how desperately you need to be forgiven and coming clean like we talked about last week with your sin and understanding the gravity and the weight and how much sin you have. And when you understand that, that is the key that unlocks you to be able to forgive others. And until you get to that place, you're like, oh, you know, I'm a good person. Like, I, I don't sin. You're, you're never going to get there. And Jesus says, i got to teach you a parable because you don't fully get it. You don't see your sin. But other people see your sin. 
Because once you realize the extent of your own forgiveness, then you will have the grace and capacity to forgive others. Are you with me? So let me keep reading. Matthew 18, 23. Um, Okay, so he says, therefore, I think I have it here. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owned him, how many talents? Are you guys serious? What does that say? 10,000 talents was brought to him. 10,000 talents was brought to him. And Jesus is making a point that we need forgiveness. He's saying, I want you to understand the extent, listen up, the extent of your debt. The story of the servant, he racks up an unimaginable debt. You know I love history. Let me give you some metrics. 10,000 talents, one single talent of silver, and this is not even gold, is 6,000 denarii. A denarii was one day's wage for common laborers. 10,000 talents, church, would be the equivalent of 60 million days' wages. You would have to work 60 million days to pay this debt. One scholar said 10,000 talents is the equivalent of all of the currency in Egypt at the time. This is an unimaginable debt. Unimaginable. It's incalculable. And we keep reading Matthew 18, verse 35. Since he was not able to pay, the Bible says, the master ordered that he and his family be sold to repay the debt. So the solution at that time was to sell him into slavery. But the problem is, a whole life into slavery was only worth one talent. So even if this guy had a big family, at the most he could ever repay, or this servant, would be about five or six talents, and he owed 10,000 talents. There's no way that the king could recover this loss. Hear me. And Matthew 18, 26 and 27 goes on to say, At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. Wow, this is such a powerful parable. The king forgave the servant. But let me just tell you something, church. The debt didn't just disappear. The king could never recover this loss. And one of the principles that you learn is that forgiveness is costly to the giver. Do you hear me? Forgiveness is costly to the giver. This debt didn't evaporate. The king had to absorb the debt. And why did he do it? The scripture says he felt compassion. This man got on his knees and begged him in humility, please forgive my my debt. And the king, full of compassion, and I told you from the beginning, the king is God in the story, full of compassion and full of pity. You say, what is God like? This is what God's like. He says, I'm going to take your debt and I'm going to pay it. And let me tell you something, church. That's the gospel. I don't know if you know what the gospel is, but let me just tell it to you for a minute. This story, the gospel's all over this story. Someone had to absorb the debt. And then who is the servant with a debt that couldn't be repaid? Who is the servant in the story? It's us. You are the servant. You say, no, no, not me, not 10,000. Yes. Think about how much you've transgressed, sins of omission, sins of commission, things that you don't even know. We've all turned away from God. The servant is you with a debt that couldn't be erased. And this is the gospel. We owe a debt we couldn't pay. And the king came to deal with our debt, our sin, 
by sending his son Jesus on a cross to absorb the debt. Colossians is very clear about the gospel. It says, for then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the debts against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. How many of you guys are thankful for Jesus? Come on. I mean, I mean, really. He absorbed the debt, and it was costly for him. He had to send his son. And this is what we have to come to first before we ha- can even have the power to forgive others. We've got to come to the point where we have to realize the debt that we have been forgiven. And when we really get to this understanding, the 10,000 talents was me. That's when the power of the gospel comes onto your life and you can freely forgive. Because look, some people don't deserve it. But here's the question the gospel asks you. Did you deserve it? They can, there's some people that are never going to be able to repay you for the wrongs that they've done. But here's the thing. Could you ever repay God for the wrongs you've done? It's at that place the gospel comes alive. So back to the story. We, we see shocking unforgiveness. But then the servant went out, verse 27, and he found one of the fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. And he grabbed him and choked him. Pay back what you owe, he demanded. And the servant begged, be patient. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he paid the debt. If you look at the character of the servant after being forgiven so much, it's disgusting. It's hard to read the parable. You're like, wait a minute. You were just forgiven all this debt. You were forgiven 10,000 talents of debt. And then you have a guy that owes you equivalent to $16. And you're ready to choke him and put him in prison. And listen, according to the law back in that time, you had the right to do that. If someone owed you a debt that they couldn't pay, you could have them put in prison. But why is it so troubling and disgusting because the servant had just been forgiven so much. And that should move him to mercy. A hundred days wage compared to 60 million days wage. It's baffling. But let me just tell you something, church. You have to stop in the parable and you have to see yourself. You have to see yourself. Whenever we hold on to a grudge, we are exactly in the same place. Whenever you hold on to unforgiveness, you're in the same place as this servant that went and choked out this guy for a hundred days' wages. You're not living the gospel. So graciously we've been forgiven. And our only appropriate response is to graciously forgive. Radical, unmarried grace of God. So one of my last points here as I come to conclusion, we are called to forgive and to release the debt. Everybody say that back to me. Release the debt. You have to release the debt. Do you know that the word forgiveness actually means to cancel the debt? In light of what you've been forgiven, you have to release the debt to the Lord. That's not condoning the sin. It's not excusing the sin. I would say, uh, my, my wife tells me this all the time, that sometimes you forgive, but then you put boundaries in place. Because you don't have to deal with abuse and call it forgiveness. But what you do is you release their debt to the Lord. Spiritually, you release the debt. You give it to God. The Bible even says, vengeance is mine. The Lord, the Lord can deal with things better than us. Can I get an amen on that? He does so much of a better job dealing with people. You're not called to fix people, as John Hobbes said. You're called to love people. And if you will love them with the love of Christ, 
you will see the Lord fix them. But when we take things into our own hands, we just make a mess. And a lot of times we alienate them from churches and from fellowship. You release the debt unto the Lord. You have to, uh, and this is a point that I learned this week, I think is really powerful. You have to forgive according to what you have received, not according to what they deserve. That's worthwhile to write down. You have to forgive according to what you have received, not according to what they deserve. And this will give you the motivation for forgiveness. Don't look at the problem to determine if they are worthy. You look at the cross and ask yourself the question, are you worthy? When you do that, you will find the capacity and the power to forgive. It's amazing in my own life. I will blow it so hard, and then I'll see someone else blow it. And it's in that moment that I am forced to have grace. And listen, when you accept God, you are forfeiting your right and your offenses. You have to, when you accept the grace of God, you're forfeiting your right to hold grudges and be bitter. And I want to end with this on the cross. One of the last things that Jesus said, it is finished. The Greek word is tetelestai. And it actually means, I paid the debt. So as we move into communion, church, it's time to release the debt. It's time to turn it over to God. You say, oh, Jamie, look what, what could Corey Tim Boone have done in that situation? She had every right to say, get away from me you sick and evil person release the debt and watch the kingdom of God come in your life in a way don't just run out of church and say hey good message don't do that allow God to show you the people that you need to forgive and maybe today you make a phone call maybe today you send an email maybe you write a letter Or maybe you spend the rest of this day on your knees saying, Lord, help me, like Corey Timboom did. Help me to forgive. Because on the other side of that is breakthrough. So I'm I'm believing the Holy Spirit's going to show you the people you need to forgive, and I believe that you are going to be free in a way, and you're going to experience God's love in a way you've never experienced it. But while we say that, we're going to come to the table. What is the table all about? The Bible actually says, hey, listen, examine yourself before you come to communion because if you have unforgiveness in your heart, don't even take it. So maybe in the quietly, uh, privacy of your own heart that you could just even say a prayer right now of that person. Lord, I release them. Pastor Colin, if you would come.